Hello everyone, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today, we're gonna to play around with a landscape painting. We're gonna use our wet and wet tonalist approach, and we're exper gonna experiment with just one color. We're gonna use light red oxide. Figure, we'll just use the rest of this Van Gogh tube right here. Now, this was inspired by somebody, I don't remember who it was, had referenced me saying they were inspired by one of my paintings and they used light red oxide solely on its own. And I thought, oh, well, that'd be cool. Let's try that out. So I'm sorry that I forgot your name or who had done that. So feel free to comment if it was you. There's somebody on the Ron Ranson Disciple page. I know it was that. Anyway, so our paper is nice and saturated. This is a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua, 140 pound, cold press, 100% cotton. Um, light red oxide, I'm not sure if it varies much from one brand to the next. You could probably use a Venetian red instead if you have that on hand. But light red is, oxide is pretty common. Light oxide red is pretty common on palettes. We'll use the Ron Ranson Hake brush. A lot of people ask which brush I'm using. Um, this is a medium Hake that I've had for about three years now. It's very well worn. So um, using a brand new Hake, even if it's the same brand, you're gonna get different effects just because of um, just the nature of how stiff and worn it is. But don't let that deter you. Have your hake, have fun with it, and uh, just go to town. So with this method, um, pulled over from Stuart Davies. He is an oil painter, very um, prolific oil painter, and has a lot of great videos on YouTube. He'll mix his colors, um, the oils, with a thinning medium. I think he uses uh, linseed oil and he'll go into the paint and come back, wipe back and forth and use a big brush. Using the same concept here, except we're utilizing uh, watercolor and wet paper. And we'll see how the wiping and the swiping works with just a light red oxide. So making up this scene as we go along. Um, I do need to start referencing some more photos, but if you wanna follow along, I'll put a picture of the final result on my Patreon for you all to download and um, paint along with. By the way, uh, if you wanna support this channel, I have uh, links below, Patreon, um, cup of coffee, Etc. Patreon has exclusive content and early access, things like that. And all that goes back into art supplies and experimenting. In a bit, I'll talk about some recent experiments I've been doing. So uh, I'm going to go bold and start painting in our sky. I add a little bit more water since it seems a little dry up here. Scrubbing it throughout. Then I'll use my paper towel to lift back and create textures. Now with this approach, uh, just keep in mind um, that whenever you lift up, you are pulling moisture out of those areas. So wet and wet will act differently in those spots. But you could always go back in with the brush and add more water. I try to paint to the edges of my paper. A uh, few reasons. If I don't, the white of the edges kind of throw me off. And if it were to ever get matted, um, it kind of gives you a little leeway with the matting. 
paper's buckling, so I push my clips down. This is just a cut of thin wood, uh, thin board from Lowe's. Someone a few videos ago had commented and suggested a foam board. It's waterproof, lightweight, and you can cut it very easily to the size that you need. So that seems like just a great solution. So at first I was painting, I was taping down my paintings, but once I started really delving into wet and wet, um, I, I really had a hard time with the fact that my paper was taped down and it wanted a buckle and couldn't stretch. So I'll tape down drawings, but watercolor, not so much. So if that's something that you're struggling with, that might be a solution. Now a few uh, commentary on the pigment and the paint. It's very, very strong, very warm. And it reminds me of the Conte crayons. Uh, it reminds me of the sanguine type color. And it being so warm, I wonder what color could be used with it if we were to do a two color palette to utilize the warmth to push forward and then kind of a cooler aspect or a mixture of a cooler to push parts back to recede. It has a good autumn feel to it. Or maybe a late afternoon feel. You can see we had texture uh, brush strokes here because we had lifted the water out when we, after we put the sky in. I think trying to get a foreground element to take place will make it interesting. So we're gonna have to work this area. So I have my card. You can take a hotel room card, a credit card, anything like that um, old school ID if you want to cut it up and we'll utilize that here we have the number one rigger usually I'll put in some wet and wet further background and let that kind of soften and diffuse but I'm thinking we'll go straight towards this kind of mid-ground foreground And just let that be completely soft. In a normal palette, if I was kind of playing around, I would use light red oxide and ultramarine for a background trees, background hills, you get kind of a purpley mixture. For an entire painting of two colors, let me know what you would like to see down below in the comments. What would you mix with the light red oxide? I'm thinking that ultramarine would be an interesting way to go. Start it out uh, with a purple mix, then use our light red oxide in the foreground. But Beyond that, nothing else is really coming to mind. I really don't use it that often. I'm guessing you could mix it with raw sienna. You probably get a terracotta type color. I probably have used that mix, but not often. Just thinking of ideas.
maybe an experiment with uh, ultramarine, then a separate one with um, phthalo blue. Okay, this is the sharp part of the credit card. This is the cut edge. It creates darker lines that backfill easier. I'm just putting texture into this tree here. I have started relying on the backfill and the open type scrapes where this is the rounded edge and we'll get back more and wider lines. Using those two to create more tonal variety and texture. And what I mean by that is the sharper edge that'll create a black backfill gives me a darker mark and then the rounder edge gives me the lighter mark. So I have a variety there and the brush mark that took place. Trying not to pass over exactly what I already painted and the purpose for that is to prevent um, like that just just to create the variety of lines and just let that density build up. Let's go here and we'll pull up some trees as well. If you push down hard on the rounded edge, you'll get that wider line. Flat cut. for a little rocky outcrop. Some people who use utilize that technique, ah, people who use that technique often, um, Joe Menza, uh, Stephen Cronin, David Usher, those are some other watercolor painters that will scrape in this fashion. So while I scrape some lines, I'll tell you about some other projects I've been working on. Today's Monday, I don't know if I mentioned that. On Friday, I was invited to go do some photography at a cemetery tour, where once a year, they set it up where they'll pick a tombstone and they'll research that person and have uh, people who will kind of act out or give a speech about said person, either being them or being somebody from that time period talking about them. Um, maybe uh, a wife talking about her husband or a son talking about his father. So anyway, I was invited to go photograph that and were really nice and friendly and I've been doing film photography so I had to do a lot of extended time lapses um, but anyway I developed my film I haven't made any cyanotype prints yet but I will soon and hopefully they'll be well received I made every mistake in the book in regards to film. All right, so now I'm taking a stronger mix with the Hake. There's less water in it. Um, the paper is naturally drying at this point. So I'm just building up this density. We could probably do a dry off at this point, but it really feels as if there's no need. Feel free to go back and forth. Creating textures and marks. It looks so vibrant looking through the camera that I'm filming with. Um, just such a strong, rich, uh, I would say almost like an orangey pumpkin type color. Well beyond that sanguine type feel. 
Let's uh, pause this. We'll do our dry off now and we'll see if there's a color shift that takes place. I don't think that there is a much one that will happen, but um, we'll watch for it. And then from there, we'll play with our next layer. I stand corrected. There was a very big shift that took place with that drying. Uh, it seemed to have pushed from the orange to more red, especially in areas like this. Uh, there was definitely a lightning that took place as well. So not only did the color seem to shift, we also had the tone shift. That was really interesting. Which, whenever we have a successfully soft background underpainting and then come in with stronger pigments, usually works out really well. So I'm excited to see what happens with this kind of second dry brush phase. I'm just taking the number one rigger and just creating some calligraphy type marks. Help ground these guys in place. That brushing on the side. I think I picked up that mark technique from two sources, um, Chinese brush painting, where if you use it on the side, they call it the axe stroke. Looks like um, an axe mark. And also from watching David Usher when I had started watercolor painting th three years ago. Him and Alan Owen are masterful at using that mark to create the illusion of trees with just a few simple um, sideways swipes. It's very interesting how the wet pigment looks more orange. I'm dealing with that same aspect again, where more pure pigment has that darker look to it. Why that's happening, I'm not sure. If you know, let me know. It obviously has to do with water in it. But if there's a way we can utilize that effect for the finished painting, that would give us a lot more variety with just one color. All right, go back to the hake, build up our foreground, and get a little bit of water on it. And when I say a little bit, I just dip the edge of the brush. And that's usually too much. So keep in mind that not much um, water has been added, if any throughout the painting process. I'm gonna deepen the edges of the painting. Give the feel that we have the brush coming over. up for a little bit of foliage coming off this little bank right here. Now, for speed's sake, here's a number four rigger. It'll hold more pigment. And if you have a light touch, you can get thinner lines. It'll help us build up our density. While working in this spot, I just started thinking about 
light red oxide and burnt umber combination. I don't know if that would essentially give you a burnt sienna feel. But to give a, a dark shadowed area, that would make an interesting two color painting. Oh, I accidentally grabbed some, I don't even know what that was, but it is wiped off. I'm gonna add some wet here so I can scrape out a big old chunk. Rock with some grass around it. I could even pull out another foreground tree. We may just have to go pure pigment. our tree that's super close to us. We'll give it a secondary tree. I passed over a tree that was already behind it. I try to avoid doing that but it would I think it would have looked weird. It was kind of just in the moment. Our branches come up and off. We can vary the texture and tonality of the tree with a card. Scraping sideways, scraping down. Probably even lift a little bit of texture out. I think we are nearing the end of this painting. We'll do a dry off in a moment after we play with the hake in this tree. Oh, but I did want to tell you, I started mentioning it earlier. So I made every film mistake in the book when I was doing the uh, cemetery photography. Um, I was using old brownie cameras. <laughs> One of them I had the bottom fall just completely off and exposed the film. Um, I had used a camera that had the slide film in the slide holder. Uh, sheet holder, I'm sorry. And because of the elapsed time that was needed or the long time frames that were needed. I was having some people stand or sit for two minutes. And one of them, about 45 minutes in, I realized I, 45 seconds in, I realized I forgot to pull the dark slide out. But it was really, really fun. There was no monetary gain or anything like that from it. It was just taking my hobby and having fun with it. And despite all those mistakes, I had a blast. And that's what I want you to keep in mind with watercolor, with experimentation, with color, experimentation, tonality, texture. Make sure you're having a blast and having fun. If you want to set yourself to a challenge, that is totally fine. You know, with this, if I, for some reason, wasn't having fun right now, uh, that'd be okay if I set myself up to the challenge of seeing what happens with just this. I'm having a blast, but um, I, I don't know if that point's kind of being made. I hope I hope it's getting across. And I'm limiting myself to one color, which may frustrate you if you try it out. Um, if I used 30 colors. It might be too much and it might frustrate you You're not sure what colors to pick so set the guidelines for your painting and have fun with it 
And if I got frustrated with this, and I couldn't get a dark that I wanted, if you set out with a challenge for yourself and then you say, you know what, I'm gonna switch over, I'm gonna add some Payne's Gray. That's fine. There is nobody restricting you. And of course, you're always welcome to follow along with any of these videos. Uh, feel free to tag me on social media. Uh, not sure who it was, but somebody in Prague had tagged me recently in a painting that they had done after following one of the tutorials uh, experiments. It was just uh, really cool. So I love seeing y'all's interpretations. I love seeing y'all's personal work as well. So down below, I have a whole bunch of personal uh, social media stuff. If you ever have any questions, feel free to ask them. Oh, and anything you do whenever you follow one of these, you can write your own name to it and you have my express permission to go ahead and sell said painting. Let me pause this and do a dry off. It's not completely dry, but I figured I would stop for a moment, splatter a little bit of water, and then I'll let it sit for a moment and lift up these little circle droplets to add a little bit of texture. A little final oomph. But yeah, like I was saying, you're more than welcome to follow along with this. I encourage you to. And I encourage you to sign your own name. And you have my express permission to sell anything you do following one of these uh, tutorials. I want you all to be successful. I want you all to have money in your pocket for art supplies. You know, it gets expensive. And you don't have to sell it too. You can give it away as a gift. You know, tis the season. I didn't really get too many interesting lifts. I did get some right there. But for an extra 30 seconds, it adds a little extra effect. All right, and here's our final result. I'll um, throw a cropped image up at the end of the video for you to look at rather than me putting a mat around this. I hope you enjoyed. I'll see you all soon. Have a great day and have fun. I'll take care.